Well, hey, everybody, great, great time worshiping God right now and, and, and just declaring, saying, singing how great he is and what he does. The fact that we will not be shaken when we trust in him. So, so good. Love it. I'm so grateful to have all of you here today. I, I want to give a message today about gratitude, about Thanksgiving in, in maybe a little bit of a different way. And, and I'm praying that God speaks to your heart and, and, and your soul as I speak today. This is Thanksgiving week. Who is ready to eat some good food this week? A few people here. You know, I mean, may, maybe you should go to In-N-Out this week just to celebrate the fact that you don't have to wait 14 hours like the people in Colorado, right? Um, I, I remember when, when Pollo Campero, anybody had that? When Pollo Campero came here to L.A., there was like hours-long line for that one. Not anymore. You know, they've opened up a lot of locations. But, but when it first came, and the, the lines were long. All right. I want to give a message today that I'm calling the Thanksgiving Matrix. So everybody, pull out your Bibles. Pull out the Word of God, get a pen and paper, or use your phone or whatever you're using, take some notes. I've got some things that I believe God wants to share with you today, and um, kind of goes in line with a lot that I have been talking about the recent weeks, but, but focusing it in on something that is so important. Again, I'm calling this the Thanksgiving Matrix. What is a matrix? A matrix is a place, a location, an environment where uh, or a material in which something develops. In fact, uh, s something similar to this, a matrix would be a woman's womb, right, where a baby develops. That is literally a matrix. It's a place where babies, where new life are developed. And so Thanksgiving is like a womb. It's a matrix where things can get developed. And I want to talk about some of those things that can get developed in your life. And so Thanksgiving causes you to get pregnant <laughs> with some good new things in your life, not in so much a physical way, but in a spiritual, emotional, and mental way. And so we're going to jump into this today. And I want to give as a foundation of this uh, passage, starting in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. And this passage right here, let me just tell you straight up, you're going to be like, what in the world does this have to do with gratitude or thanksgiving? So stay with me here, get those Bibles open, and we're going to go through this together. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, says this, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. I know some of you are thinking, I thought this is about gratitude. Keep with me here. Verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So Paul is saying something very simple here. He's saying, listen, right in front of every human, is the evidence that God exists. What is on earth, what is in the sky, is enough evidence for any person to recognize that God exists. I want you to do something. Stare at somebody for a moment. Like half a second, a second, two seconds. Make it really, really awkward. Just, you know, I, I'm staring at you, Gilbert. You the man. All right. And, uh, and, and, and listen, that person right in front of you that you just stared at awkwardly is proof that God exists. Total and complete proof right there, right in front of you. And so he says it, right? They have no excuse for not knowing God. Verse 21, watch what he says. And Paul is talking about past people. He says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't, watch this, worship him as God or even give him thanks. They wouldn't worship him or give him thanks. Worship him or give him thanks. These two things are absolutely important. And so watch what happens to people that choose to not worship God or give him thanks. He says it. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Utter fools. And instead of 
worshiping the glorious, ever-living God. They worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Or in other words, when the people of this earth chose to not worship God or give him thanks, they had to create a substitute for God. And that substitute were idols that looked like people or animals. And so when you don't worship and honor God and give him thanks, then all of a sudden your eyes are not on God and you have to create another version of God that you can follow. In today's world, we're obviously not making idols uh, in, in most of Western society. We don't make idols of, you know, people or reptiles that we bow down and worship, but, but we do have idols that might look like success or riches, idols that look like fame and many other types of things, idols that look like ourselves. We make ourselves the idol that we worship, thinking we're all great and amazing. The reality is when there is no worship and there is no gratitude, human beings create substitutes for God, because when you don't worship God and you don't have gratitude towards God, you don't see God. And when you don't see God, you have to look for something else to replace God. This is very normal, what Paul is saying right here. And this is going to lead into three things that thanksgiving, three things that gratitude can accomplish in our lives or show us in our lives. Gratitude is powerful. Look at somebody close to you and tell them gratitude is powerful. Go for it. It totally is. Totally is. So let me share. Let, let me just jump right into these. The first one is this. Gratitude blesses our relationships. Gratitude blesses our relationships. I want you to go to the book of Colossians. It's uh, on your way closer to the end of scripture you know, about six, seven books before the end of Scripture. But Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 to 15 says this. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always... Be thankful. Somebody say it with me, always be thankful. Now notice the key word there, always. Paul doesn't say, yeah, so about, you know, 75% of the time, be thankful. That, that works. He doesn't say, be thankful when everything's good, but you know what, when it's all bad, you're excused from thankful. No, Paul makes it clear, always be thankful. Now, I want you to understand the context here of what is going on because we're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving, to be with family and friends and, and that whole deal, to eat some good food. Is anybody ready to do their Thanksgiving grub coming up? Man, I, I, I am ready for that. And, uh, and, and so here's the deal. When we think about this, Paul is actually talking about relationships right here in the book of Colossians in, in, in these verses. He's talking about relationships. And I know some of you, have some messed up relationships in your life. Not because you're a bad person, okay? I'm not accusing a single person here. But, but I'm saying some of you were talking politics with family members, and then the election happened, and then you're like, I'm never talking to you again. You, you didn't say that because you love Jesus and you love people, but they told you that, right? And uh, or, or you have broken relationships because of whatever messed up stuff has happened in the past. I don't know. But, but some of us come to seasons like Thanksgiving or Christmas, and, and, and we think about our relationships and how we, we have some broken relationships. And Paul is actually making something really clear here, that love will bring harmony. Love will bring harmony. Secondly, that God's peace will bring harmony. And then he says, always be thankful. And you're like, what does that have to do with relationships? Very clear. Because loving and sacrificing for somebody else will bring relationships together that have been broken. Watch this. Then God's peace allows us to walk in relationships in a unique way. And then, and I'll get to this. It'll make sense in a minute. And then thankfulness helps us to maintain those 
relationships. And so gratitude blesses our relationships. So let me, let me break it down a little bit more. Everybody understands the general concept of love and sacrificing and giving and how that can cross boundaries and barriers and, and bring unity where there wasn't or harmony where there wasn't. But the Paul makes it clear that we need to receive God's peace, God's peace, and how this will bring about peace in our relationships. And, and I want you to get this because so often, and I preached about this a few weeks ago, so often we're looking at peace from an external earthly perspective. And see, you're not going to get relationships restored this type of way. It's just, it, it's not going to happen. It happens because you receive God's peace in your heart and soul. And then from God's peace, you bless your relationships with God's peace. And so if you can engage your relationships already filled with God's peace, that can actually do an incredible thing. And so we are called to love. We are called to be at peace with God's peace and then to always be thankful. You know, thankfulness has an incredible impact on our relationships. You know, I, I, I've found this to be true. That in today's world, among those that don't believe in Jesus, but listen to me closely, among also those that do believe in Jesus, we have a severe lack of gratitude. It's not just a good idea, gratitude, and, you know, everybody be more thankful. No, no, no. I, let me make it clear. You and I don't deserve anything. We are not owed anything by anyone or by God himself. We deserve nothing. Yet I've seen a lot of people living their lives as if they believe that they deserve everything. It is a common thing that is going across our society across the culture nowadays, where, where people think, yeah, just my existence as a human being means that I deserve certain things. We, we deserve nothing on this earth. And in fact, the salvation that you and I have received from God, we don't deserve that. But I've preached this and said it many times, that if that is all that we get from God, that is more than enough. In fact, if COVID were to last for the next 50 years of my life, and I died under lockdown for 50 years, here's what I know, that I have eternity with God. And there's no lockdown there. There's pure freedom there. If, if an election can't be decided for some weird reason and everything goes downhill, and for the next 50 years, a country goes into anarchy, I'm not saying that's going to happen. Now I'm just thinking worst case scenario. If that were to happen for the next 50 years, God's salvation and eternity with him is more than enough and more than I deserve. Meaning if everything goes wrong on this earth, I should and could still live grateful every day of my life because I have already received more than I could ever deserve in this life and the one to come. And that is true. But I find it amazing that we approach our relationship with so little gratitude. So little gratitude. When you approach a relationship from a place of I deserve their love, I deserve what they do, they owe me this, let me tell you, that's going to break relationships. But when you approach relationships from a place of I'm thankful, thank you for doing this, thank you for doing that, Thank you for doing the other. That is going to bless your relationships. Man, if, if you could start a competition, rather than starting competition of whose candidate wins the election or competition of who runs faster or competition of who can eat the most food, anybody doing that competition? Amen. Uh, but whatever competition you want to do, how about this? Start a competition of who can say thank you the most amount of times. That's worthy of competing for and with, because that will actually bless your relationships. I have a child, Daniel, my, my youngest, six years old, who, who, who is, you know, started doing this thing where he says, I love you. And with me, it's in Spanish, but he goes, I love you. And I'm like, I love you. 
And he goes, I love you, I love you, I love you. Like three times. I'm like, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm like, I beat you five. And then he's like, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I'm secretly counting it in my head, right? And he gets to like 11. And then I'm like, I ain't just going to blow him out of the water. And I say, I love you, I love you, I love you like 25 times. And finally at the end, he's like, you win. But I still love you, right? You know? And, and if we could create that type of competition, a competition to be the most thankful, the, the most filled with gratitude that is going to bless your relationships this week and every week afterwards as well. Second thing, gratitude lets me see God bigger. Gratitude lets me see God bigger. It lets me see him clearer as well. Psalm chapter 69 Verse 30, Psalm 69, 30. I, I, I love this verse. Watch what David says here. He says, then I will praise God's name with singing and I will honor him with thanksgiving. I will praise God's name with singing and I will honor him with thanksgiving. Now, why would he do that? Well, verse 29 tells us, he says, I am suffering and in pain. Rescue me, O God, by your saving power. And so you rescue me, and I will praise your name with singing, and I will honor, honor God with thanksgiving. And, and it's interesting here, because he actually says the two things that I mentioned in the book of Romans at the beginning of the message. I want you to track this with me through the whole message. He mentions worship, and he mentions thanksgiving. Worship and thanksgiving. Keep that in your mind, in your notes, write it down, whatever. Keep it because it's important. All right. But, but I want to focus in on one word here where he says, I will honor. Everybody say the word honor. He says, I will honor him. I will honor God with thanksgiving. This is important. That word honor in the Hebrew literally means magnify, like magnifying glass type of magnify. This is, I, I, I grew up singing, you know, songs that, that, that would say, like, I, I, I magnify you, God. And, you know, and it, it sounds a little weird, like, God, I magnify you. And it's like, well, what are you talking about, right? I magnify God. And, and, and if you think about magnify, just in the simplest terms, like a magnifying glass, it's literally that when you look through the magnifying glass, you see something as bigger. You can see it clearer than what your own human eyes can see on its own. Think about a microscope, right? That magnifies to even greater detail something that your human eyes cannot perceive. And what David is literally saying here is that I magnify God with thanksgiving. My thanksgiving allows me to see God clearer and bigger than ever before. This is so important because here's what happens when you don't have a heart of gratitude. When you don't have a heart of gratitude, all you see is the negativity around you. You see COVID and you see elections and you see broken relationships and you see a dirty street or a dirty house. You see the money that's, you know, going away from the bank account and you see how all these things are messed up around you and how you can't get your hair fixed in the morning or whatever other negative thing that can happen in your life and you look at all that negativity and you know what happens with God in your life? You see less and less of him because you're more focused on the negativity that you go, where's God? I don't see God in this. Where's God? God's not here. God's not active. God's not doing anything because all you're doing is you're focused on everything that is wrong. Let me remind you, according to Paul, he said, always be thankful, including when everything is all wrong. You can still always be thankful. And so what happens when we are thankful to God? Watch this. It shifts my eyes from what's wrong to God. It shifts my perspective from what's broken to God. And so when I look at God more, I magnify him. I begin to see God greater than I saw him before. And if you're seeing God as less and less, it's because you don't have a heart of gratitude and you're looking around at everything that's wrong. But to see God greater than before is to become grateful to him. And what in the world can I be grateful to God for if everything is bad? Well, let me give you a list. I can be grateful to him that I'm alive one other day. 
that there's air to breathe today. I can be grateful that his mercies are new every single morning. And a new day is a new opportunity for God to do something new in me. Maybe the problems will still be there, but God can do something new in Jeff today and tomorrow and the day after that. Every day is a gift from God where I can reach more people from Jesus who are going through brokenness in their own lives. Every single day is a gift from God to be a blessing to somebody else. There is a whole lot to be thankful for even if you have the worst life ever. There's a whole lot you can be thankful for. And so when we are grateful to God, it literally makes God bigger in our lives. It doesn't make God bigger himself. He's already as big as big can be. But it makes him bigger in us, clearer to us. Where we saw him at 5% before, we can see him at 10% or 15% or 20% now. The more that we give thanks to God. The more that you have thanksgiving, it will allow, it's a matrix of thanksgiving, it will allow the development of a heart that can see God more clearly than ever before. That is what gratitude does. This is not just some nice little trick or some nice little suggestion from the Bible that just says, yeah, it's good to give thanks, so obey God and say thank you. This is showing you that there is a legit power to gratitude that can transform your entire life if you commit yourself to it. This is not just a here, do it once a year because it's a good idea. No, this is a literally God will transform and change things. But could I recommend to you that this Thanksgiving with family, before you eat, before you feast, before you do anything else, could you take a moment and, and, and give thanks to God? Could you take a moment and thank each other? And if you're with a whole bunch of unbelievers, could you say, hey, can, can we take a moment to just give thanks to each other? And, and if you're cool with it, could I maybe give thanks to God for how he has blessed us and that we get to be together and, and allow it to be an opportunity of gratitude that is transformative in your life and in the lives of those around you. It will allow you to see God greater, but get this, it'll allow others to see God greater as well because of your thanksgiving. And the third one is this. Gratitude recognizes God's immovable kingdom. Gratitude recognizes God's immovable kingdom. I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. Gratitude recognizes God's immovable kingdom. This one is, is, is so important. So important. Let me explain this, or let me read this and then go through it. Starting in verse 25 of Hebrews 12, it says, Be careful, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one, as in Jesus, to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. So, so he's making something really simple, talking about the people of Israel when they were in the desert, and that their job was to listen to Moses, God's earthly messenger, and they didn't do that, and they were punished for it. And so Paul is saying, listen, well, what do you think will happen if they were punished for not listening to Moses, the earthly messenger, if we don't listen to God, the heavenly divine being that has instructions for us, if they got punished for disobeying Moses, what will happen for disobeying God, right? Now, stick with me here. Verse 26. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Everybody look at somebody else and say, this promise is for you. Amen, 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 amen. This promise is for you. This is so. So Paul uses a past example to talk about a future reality. And he says this promise. Once again, I, God, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. You know, when I look at the world falling to pieces, it just simply reminds me of the fact that we are coming to a day 
when everything that is shakable is going to be shaken, where everything that is, can be moved is going to be moved, where everything that can be removed is going to be removed. And the only thing that is going to remain is that which is unshakable. So the question is, what is unshakable? Well, the next verse will tell us the answer to that. Since we are receiving a kingdom, look at somebody and tell them you are receiving a kingdom. You believe in Jesus, you are receiving a kingdom. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, a kingdom that is immovable. This is the reality. We were just singing this song right before the message today, right? That I will not be I think it was shaken or moving or something like that, but, but all of the above, that I will, I will not be shaken. There is nothing that is going to move me. This earth could literally give way. Mountains can be thrown into the sea. Everything could go downhill. All of what was good in the world could disappear, but what will remain is God's unshakable and immovable kingdom. And when I have received God in my life, then my feet are firmly planted on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and every wave can go around me and everything can be stripped away and removed out of this world. But I will remain solid on the solid rock of Jesus in his unshakable kingdom. And can somebody say amen to that one? And that is the reality for our lives. So watch this. If that is true, and it is, then what Paul says next is important. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful. Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Let us be thankful. And let's worship him, which is pleasing to God. God is a devouring fire, meaning he will remove everything that is broken, everything that is not his or him. It's all going to be removed. So that way, all that will be left is the unshakable kingdom of God, which we can receive in our lives. And for that, we need to be thankful and we need to worship God. Him. What thankfulness does is that allows me to receive, to see, to better engage the unshakable kingdom of God in my life. Now, let me tell you something. I was um, preparing for this message and looking up verses about gratitude, and I had something in my heart that I wanted to share. But, but, but I just wanted to look up as many verses about gratitude and thanks, thankfulness, thanksgiving as I possibly could. And, and as I was going through and, 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 and just taking a look at what does gratitude do in our lives, what does it accomplish, I, I came across the verses that I ended up putting together for this message. And what I didn't realize initially was as I put all these together that there was a thread that ran straight through all of them, straight through all of them. And the thread is this, gratefulness or gratitude and worship, gratitude and worship. Paul made it clear in Romans chapter one that when people decided to not worship God or be grateful to him, they ended up creating substitutes for God. Idols is what they made because they lacked worship and they lacked gratitude. And when you and I lack worship and gratitude, we make idols. I guarantee it. The less gratitude you have, the more idols exist in your life. It's very clear, and it's scriptural. The more gratitude to God you have, the more worship to God you have, the more you make him your idol, right? Your focus, your everything. And so Paul makes that clear in Romans 1, but then we jump to Psalm 69 with David, who recognizes that he needs to praise God and to honor him, magnify him with what? With gratitude, with thanksgiving. And so it also happened there. 
And then we jump forward to Hebrews chapter 13, and all of a sudden we realize that we receive this unshakable kingdom. And because of that, what does Paul tell us to do? He tells us to give thanks and to worship God, to please God by worshiping Him. Worship and gratitude. Worship and gratitude. Worship and gratitude are transformative in your life. This is not just a good idea. This is not just a, hey, Scripture suggested it, and so, you know, maybe think about doing it here and there. No, this is a, these things will change everything in your life. If you would choose to live with gratitude and worship, it will literally transform everything. It'll transform your relationships. It'll transform your relationship with God. It'll transform your stability in your life in the midst of things that can go wrong that you will not be shaken no matter what gets shaken around you. Your bank account could be shaken, but you won't be shaken. Relationships can be shaken, but you won't be shaken. Gratitude literally does this in your life. It's not just a nice little thing to do when you think about it. It's something that will transform everything. There is a power, a spiritual power in living a life of consistent and growing gratitude. I know you know people and have people in your life that never show gratitude. And those people are not fun to be around. You know who I'm talking about. I don't know who I'm talking about, but you do. You know, you have those people. Or maybe you've been that person. I'm not judging you, okay? I'm not, no, no accusations, but maybe you have been. And God is inviting you to live a different type of life, one of worship and gratitude. Because where gratitude exists, it's a matrix, it's a womb that allows for the birth, the birth, new beginnings of relationships, new growth with God, new stability in the shifting world around you. Thanksgiving does those things in your life. And so I want to encourage you, maybe consider that you could start by thanking God today. And then tomorrow, and then Tuesday, and Wednesday, then Thursday with, when you gather with friends, family, whoever it is you gather with. And then on Friday and Saturday again, you give gratitude. And next Sunday, no matter what I preach about, you can also give gratitude next Sunday. And allow for this week not to be a one-off week or a nice little exercise, but allow this week to become uh, a spark of a new type of lifestyle that you choose to live. One that is filled with gratitude to God and to others. It will literally change your life in every way you could ever imagine. It's not just a good idea. It's a biblical concept that will literally change your life if you choose to follow. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful and thankful this morning for the opportunity you have given us to be together, together in home churches around LA and beyond, together with family, kids and husbands and, and wives and aunts and uncles and whoever else we might be gathering with right now. And Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your life. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all that you do inside of each and every one of us. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your healing. We thank you, Lord, for your freedom. We thank you for your restoration, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord. You have been and continue to be and will always be good to us. Jesus, we thank you. And Lord, I pray that today, you would, that you would develop a new heart in us. Change our hearts. For we have not lived lives of gratitude, of thanksgiving. Forgive us, Lord, and change us. We don't want to live lives where we think that we are owed or deserve anything but every benefit and every blessing that comes from you or anybody else 
is an opportunity to be grateful. From the smallest to the biggest things, would you develop in us a heart of gratitude? Because we know it will transform our relationships. It will transform how we see you. And it will allow us to be strong and immovable in the face of movable things on this earth. And Lord, I pray for every person that today has not yet made a decision to follow you, that today would be their day of saying yes to you. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of leaving the past behind and entering into the newness of life that you have for each and every person. And so today, Lord God, would you save the souls of those people that need you more than ever before. May today mark a new beginning where they leave their sin behind and leave the past behind and step out of death and step into life that you provide, eternal and abundant life. In Jesus' name, we pray that you would do all of these things. Amen and amen.